I was considering doing a Halloween episode of Esoterica, and then it sort of dawned on me. It's kind of always Halloween around here. I mean, I say the word necromancy more times in a week than I think most people do in a year. I just spent all week reading demonological literature in Latin, and I just wrapped up a two-hour series on possession by the evil dead. So it's really worth wondering, do I really need a spooky Halloween-specific edition of Esoterica? Well, sadly, this Halloween is going to be dominated for most of us by COVID-19. So that means going to shows, going to parties, going out trick-or-treating, or even going together to local abandoned haunts really isn't going to be possible or safe. So given that reality, what better could we do than cozy up together and watch some scary movies? As I'm sure you know, most media, like video games and movies, that use the esoteric or the occult as a plot device usually do so in a really haphazard way. It's just kind of a random pentagram or strange symbols. It's really just an esoteric veneer. There's no real substance or research behind it. The novels of Dennis Wheatley are an interesting exception to this rule. Because of his rather serious, if not oppositional, study of the occult, his novels actually have a profound depth of understanding of occult ideas, occult rituals, and occult materia. So in this episode of Esoterica, I want to explore and recommend a really fun occult-inspired and occult-themed film, the 1968 film The Devil Rides Out, or The Devil's Bride as it was known in the United States, based on the 1934 novel of the same name by Dennis Wheatley. I have to admit it's a rather fun jaunt into some great occult-themed material and has some interesting connections with some classic grimoires, the occult revival of the 1960s, and of course to the great beast himself, Aleister Crowley. So I hope you'll join me as we explore this classic of Hammer Horror, the 1968 film, The Devil Rides Out. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. As I mentioned in my previous review of the really wonderful film, A Dark Song, I just want to begin with the caveat that I don't have any training in film analysis or criticism. And what I really want to do is bring to bear some analysis of how Western esotericism is functioning in these various films and media. So while I can't admit to having any training in film analysis and criticism, I hope that by highlighting how Western esotericism and Western occultism are functioning in this film in a scholarly way is useful and interesting. So, with that said, some spoilers ahead for both the film and the novel version of The Devil Rides Out. I also have to say that some of my fondest Halloween memories growing up were staying up late watching scary movies, and the Hammer movies, especially The Devil Rides Out, made an incredibly strong impression on me as a young person. There's something very thick about the way the occult is used in the film that struck me, even as a young person, as very believable. And then, there, of course, there's all the very lurid dancing of the Sabbath, and the appearance of Baphomet, or the devil himself, in the film was always very eerie and uncanny to me. Oh yeah, the devil appears within the first 45 minutes of this film, so get ready. The Devil Rides Out stars Christopher Lee as the deft and aristocratic Duke de la Richelieu, who must save his friend and ward Simon from the clutches of evil. Specifically in this case, from the clutches of an international satanic cult led by the evil Makata. Here played by the equally intense Charles Gray, who would of course go on to fame as a Bond villain. For any Hammer fans out there, seeing Lee play the protagonist in a film is a real treat. Of course, he's typically known as playing none other than the Prince of Darkness himself, Dracula, and his commanding performance on screen as a good guy in this film is absolutely amazing. The film is directed by Hammer House legend Terence Fisher, and the score is intense and spooky. The title sequence alone is gloomy and powerful, filled with lurid flames and occult imagery and cycles drawn from various historical grimoires. And of course, like many Hammer films, we're treated to glorious, bright technicolor. So I'm not going to go into a long, detailed analysis of the plot. It's basically a good versus evil story. But what I am interested in is just how occult ritual and occult ideas function in both the novel and in the film. For instance, while the film version uses a Christian cross as a kind of amulet to protect Simon from the occult power of the evil Makata, the book version actually employs a swastika, 
although it's interesting that while the swastika is being used, the novel constantly reminds the reader that the Nazis have misappropriated this original symbol of power and goodness for their own evil ends. Remember that the novel, written only in 1934, was written only a couple years after Hitler had become Chancellor of Germany. This triumph of Christianity theme also appears at the end of the film itself. After Makata is destroyed and his cult is annihilated, the cross is the only thing left behind, representing a kind of triumph of Christianity over the power of evil occultism. However, this theme is interestingly disrupted by the fact that the Duke de Richelieu doesn't use simply faith in Christianity to defeat the forces of evil. He uses his own counter magic. So in some sense, what we have in The Devil Rides Out is a battle between two maguses, both using occult forces, or magical forces at least, in the interest of either good or evil. And in the 1968 film version, this Christian element is sort of tacked on in the middle and the end as a kind of bookmark, but sits uncomfortably with the reality that both of the main protagonist and the antagonist are in fact using various occult forces in their battle with one another. So despite the trappings of Christian triumphalism at the end of the film, what we really have are two maguses engaged in occult and magical combat. So along with magical combat, I also have to say there's an incredible car chase featuring some real classics. So if I'm going to pursue satanic evil through Europe, you best believe I want to do it in a 29 Invicta 3 liter. So even if you're not really into like dueling maguses with magical powers, just pause it to take a look at some of these really amazing cars. The Devil Rides Out is probably one of the best Hammer films ever made, and the campy special effects only add to its charm, honestly. But what I think is really important is about when this film debuted and the occult and historical setting in which this movie appeared. The Devil Rides Out was released in 1968, the same year as Rosemary's Baby. And whereas in Rosemary's Baby, the images of the occult and the devil are primarily in these very dreamlike sequences in which we hardly get a glimpse of supernatural evil until the very end, The Devil Rides Out is practically saturated with evil from the very get-go. This is also only a year after the first satanic baptism performed by Anton LaVey by the Church of Satan in San Francisco in 1967. Of course, the film was released at the very end of The Summer of Love and only a year before the infamous Manson murders in the same area. Thus putting The Devil Rides Out, or The Devil's Bride as it was known in the US, they changed the name because The Devil Rides Out apparently sounded too much like a western for their tastes, right in the middle of the occult revival of the late 1960s. So given their position in the occult revival and the rise of the New Age movement in the late 1960s, films like The Devil Rides Out, Rosemary's Baby, and the 1973 film The Exorcist are going to go on to frame just how the occult is perceived in popular imagination, for better or worse. So the way The Devil Rides Out frames the occult is going to have long-term ramifications in popular imagination, and it's in the film that we have a very interesting depiction of the occult itself. Here, it is some combination of highly intellectual, yet highly sensual. At the same time that it is bookish and astronomical, it is also sensual with the dances at the Sabbath. And while the occult is depicted as having a charismatic leader in the form of Makata, what's interesting is that the cult that is led by him seems to be representing both men and women, but also it is multi-ethnic and multinational. Despite the fact that Makata's cult is, well, you know, evil, there's some interesting things to note about its composition. It's primarily egalitarian in terms of gender and seems to represent a great deal of ethnicities from out the world. This is in stark contrast to many of the occult organizations that existed in the 1930s and even in the 1960s that were primarily boys clubs and mostly white boys clubs, which often had very denigrating attitudes toward non-white and non-European people. So Makata's cult represents sort of the new world order of cults, and of course this represents, in fact, the fears and anxieties of the author Dennis Wheatley, which I'll talk about in a moment. And that leads us to what is perhaps the most interesting thing about the film, just how the occult features into it. As I've mentioned, the 1968 film is based on the 1934 novel of the same name by Dennis Wheatley. Wheatley himself had a lifelong interest in the occult, although he actually uses his seven or so occult novels primarily as cautionary tales. Wheatley himself was a staunch conservative and monarchist and saw the decline of the British Empire as a threat to civilization itself. Indeed, to his mind, the rise in the interest of the occult was a symptom of just that decay. 
His occult-themed novels were in some sense meant to wet the palate of the reader so they would venture no further into occult studies. At the beginning of the 1934 novel, he even warns the reader of the perils of the occult and disclaims himself, saying while he knows a great deal about the occult, he's never practiced magic in any form, white or black. Though such a warning and disclaimer probably had the psychological effect of making the occult seem even more alluring to the reader rather than keeping them away from it. Despite Wheatley's negative view of the occult, we have to admit that he did do his homework, and he was rather intimately acquainted with many members of the 1930s London occult scene, including, famously, Aleister Crowley. Indeed, the novel's version of Makata is very clearly based on Crowley, both physically and philosophically. Crowley's influence is perhaps most apparent in both the novel and the film in their discussions of magic. There, they define magic as, quote, the art and science of causing change in conformity to one's will. Of course, anyone familiar with Aleister Crowley's ideas will immediately recognize this definition of magic from Book 4. Of course, Crowley's conception of will and true will, as they're later developed into the Thelemic religion, are incredibly complicated at both a philosophical and a religious level, although in the film and the novel, they're simply reduced to the evil will of the devilish Makata. Further, the imagery of debauchery and even the multicultural nature of Makata's group actually reflect Wheatley's own cultural fears and political anxieties. Here, the occult functions as both a symptom and a gateway to the decay of civilization itself. Indeed, Wheatley saw both Nazism and Communism as basically the rise of two dual, equally satanic forces. Further, in his mind, the decline of the British Empire left the formal colonies to their own devices, and Wheatley saw this as a complete disaster. While we might watch The Devil Rides Out and see an occult group that is basically multi-ethnic and has some degree of gender egalitarianism, Wheatley would see this as a post-colonial nightmare. In this case, the rise of the occult among these various nations represents the decay of civilization rather than some liberal progress. Luckily, however, very little of these more reactionary elements from Wheatley's idea actually survive into the Hammer film itself. Of course, the novel and the film happily drop keen references to all manner of topics in occultism, from Kabbalah to alchemy to astrology. There are even mentions of some of the classic grimoires like the Key of Solomon. There's even pretty exact descriptions of the kinds of herbs and roots and fumigations to be used, along with magical incantations in the duel between Makata and the Duke. Even the magical circle drawn on the floor to resist the occult powers of Makata are actually taken from historical grimoires. While the film is certainly saturated with occult themes and ideas, I will say the novel goes into them in a great deal more detail. There's even a scene in the novel where sci-fi and the occult are melded. There, the protagonists actually travel to the fourth dimension to fight evil. There's something about the melding of sci-fi and the occult that I find to be terribly interesting. Of course, here I'm reminded of H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Dreams in the Witch House which was written in 1932, but published in 1934. That short story, as you may know, deals in really interesting ways with the use of the occult, alternate dimensions of space and time, non-Euclidean ideas, and the use of science fiction and the occult to sort of meld these together into a composite that is both gothic and scientifically avant-garde at the same time. Although the 1968 film also employs this fourth dimensional aspect in the film, it does so a bit more haphazardly, but I will say that there's something really interesting about the intersection between science fiction, science, and the occult that just makes for excellent storytelling. All in all, The Devil Rides Out is a fun, spooky film that depicts the occult with some degree of attention, although not in a terribly coherent or altogether systematic way. Of course, for anyone interested in Western esotericism, you'll find all kinds of excuses while you're watching the film to pause it, to look at weird alchemical diagrams, to look at magical circles written on the floor, and you'll catch all kinds of passing references to historical texts like the Key of Solomon. So from my point of view, it's really fun as a person who's interested in the history of Western esotericism to watch a film where these names and ideas get dropped like breadcrumbs along the way, and you're like, oh yeah, I see what you did there. Of course, if you like the film, you should also check out the novel as well, especially for reading it in its time there in the 30s. There's a lot of really interesting use of ideas from Western esotericism really forged together into one coherent plot device. Of course, that fusing together of many elements from Western esotericism into a modern kind of religiosity or spirituality is going to be hugely important from the 1930s 
all the way into the 1960s and until now. While most of the time here at Esoterica, we stay pretty sharply focused on the scholarly and the academic study of Western esotericism, this is just a great excuse to watch a really fun film imbued with a lot of the ideas that we discuss on this channel. And of course, sometimes it's just worth it to have fun, especially during these trying times. So if you're looking for a classic of a cult film and you just want something fun to do on Halloween night, I really recommend you check out The Devil Rides Out. If you're interested in the history of magic, the occult, Kabbalah, and alchemy, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out our other content. Some of our upcoming episodes are going to focus on early Christian magic in Egypt, ancient Gnostic rituals, the earliest European alchemical text, the famous Abramelin operation, and the legendary scrying sessions of Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly as they revealed the so-called Enochian magical system. And also stay tuned for the announcement of our upcoming winter seminar where we're going to be spending several weeks studying a topic in Western esotericism in some significant detail. Also, if you want to support our work of making scholarly, accessible, and free content available on topics in Western esotericism, please consider supporting our work via Patreon or with a one-time donation. Your support really does make Esoterica possible. So, I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Halloween and a wonderful Samhain. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.